Last week, Imperial Oil, based in Alberta, laid off 900 workers, and that raised a lot of in, uh, interest in the industry and where it's going and if we're going to see further layoffs. So I did an opinion piece where I talked about what's happening at a global level, and this is not uh, unusual. It's happened before, and there are both structural and market reasons for it. But today I'm going to talk to Ed Hurst, energy economist at the University of Houston, to get into it in a little more detail. So welcome to the interview, Ed. Thank you, Markham. This, is that not the case? I mean, every industry, as it matures, it goes through this process of consolidation, adopting new technologies, becoming more efficient. And we shouldn't be surprised that the oil and gas industry is going through it too. Uh, that's absolutely right. I mean, what we're seeing with oil and gas today is a lot of downward pressure on price. We're well down from the $80 we had in January. Uh, domestically in the U.S., we've seen a lot of uh, push up on the cost side. And, you know, to be fair, the industry uh, domestically uh, in the S&P 500 has been the worst performing sector for the last 12, 15 years. So capital is, is not running into the oil patch. There is uh, no prospective growth in the market. We're looking at 101 to 103 million barrels a day. We're not going to go to 150 million barrels a day. Uh, the cheaper alternatives of the renewables are coming in. The developing world is not going to use gasoline and diesel when they can use batteries and solar. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a turning point for the industry. Right now, especially in the United States, rigs are, rigs are being laid down, people are being laid off, and the, the independents are content to go ahead and pump what they have and collect on the hedges that they put in place when Trump took office. I expect to see a wave of selling among independent oil companies really over the next six months. We've just had the bank borrowing redeterminations. You know, they can sell the assets today. They can, they can bank uh, their hedges and, and go home. Um, those are some of the structural changes that are taking place. And what I find interesting is, I don't know what it's like in, uh, in uh, Texas where you are, Ed, but I can tell you what it's like in, in Canada is those structural changes you just mentioned, OPEX driving down uh, you know, oil prices to take more market share, the rise of electric, electricity, renewables, and, and electrotech to use the electricity and displace oil, all of that stuff here in Canada is just ignored. We don't even talk about it. And is the oil industry in the United States similarly blinded? Well, <sighs> Really, they can only look beyond the tanks just a little bit. Uh, it's very difficult for the independent producer to to take a long term strategic view. I mean, we can see Exxon Mobil is looking ahead. Exxon Mobil has developed a new graphite compound that uh, will help batteries charge faster. Uh, has been working on alternative fuel resources for a long time. Uh, Imperial, of course, is is owned by Exxon Mobil. That's a, a reallocation of capital for or the company, the, the independents, they don't think that way. Uh, they, for example, we talked about ConocoPhillips not too long ago, 25% of the workforce, you know, somebody was, was asleep at the, at the wheel there. That's, that's a challenge. And as we look out with the oil patch, we're looking ahead to, to the Middle East in particular, uh, worrying about whether they're going to leave any oil in the ground over the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years. Is that going to be a stranded asset? Well, if they're worried about that, those of us in the United States and Canada need to be really worried about that because we have the high cost oil in the global market. We can be undercut anytime. Let's talk about some of the technology changes that are affecting the oil and gas industry. Because I remember in doing some interviews a few years ago where the point was made that digital technologies, uh, robotics, automation, on and on, have, were adopted by the manufacturing sector 20 years ago. And the right. oil and gas industry has been slower to adopt those technologies, but particularly during the pandemic and after, really accelerated that. And are we seeing, you know, AI, robotics, remote sensors, you know, replacing manual field work, uh, even uh, leading to fewer uh, engineers and technical people in the head offices? Uh, you know, one of the small independents I know here in the Houston area uh, went to a two-man rig 
uh, 10 years ago, uh, saving them a huge amount of labor and, and with the automation for the, the field they were developing. We know, for example, that 10 years ago, NOV was collecting about a terabyte of data from the drilling rigs out in the Permian. They just didn't have a way to use it at the time. And now with the, the advent of, of AI and, and these magnificent algorithms, you know, taking the data and, and manipulating it into something that gives you a useful story is easier. You know, it, it's very different. I mean, we've all run into things like chat GPT, uh, mucking up stories in the newspaper or online, you know, but for science where, where the engineering factors and, and, and Newton's laws all apply, you know, this gets to be really helpful. And so over time, we would expect to see uh, a lot of the geology uh, done by, by computers. We're going to see fewer people going into these, these trades. Uh, uh, AI can't replace uh, uh, hard labor, but I mean, essentially, you know, everything that's done offshore is done with uh, remote operated vehicles because the pressures are so, so intense. And, and so this way of, of thinking about how to do it better is, is now finally reaching through the oil patch. You know, every time there's a price downturn, there's a, a real rush to innovate and cut cost. Uh, I, this is uh, really germane to where you are in, in Texas because that's the Permian Basin and it does five or six million barrels a day. It's a very, very large field, but it's, become, it's a high cost field. And a lot of these high cost basins are beginning to decline. There's been a shift within the industry from exploration, finding new fields, to optimizing what you have. And anytime you've you've got those kind of pressures, one would think that there would be uh, labor-saving technologies adopted. Absolutely. And that was always the goal with these, these tight shale plays, the sands plays. Now, how can we get it out and get it out at a, at a competitive price? Uh, you know, the Barnett Shale is where... George Mitchell started with with fraction, uh, uh, first with verticals and then with horizontals. Um, the Barnett is is a gas play that would still makes a lot of sense if the gas price gets up to about six dollars per thousand cubic feet. There's not a lot of exploration going on in the Barnett right now because natural gas prices have been around four bucks and less for the last several years, and so the the more prolific areas, the Haynesville, the uh, Marcellus, the Utica, and then the, the associated gas production out of the Permian is, is leading it. That doesn't mean, of course, the gas is run away from the Barnett. It's still there. And you know, if the price uh, rises enough, we'll go back to doing more exploration. But right now, it just doesn't pay for itself. What are the uh, what's the likelihood that uh, we're going to see prices pick up? Like this is just a normal boom and bust. The industry has seen enough booms and busts over the, the 125 years uh, that it's built it part of the culture. But it seems it feels like maybe this time it's a little different because of all these structural changes we're talking about: the energy transition, the new technologies. Is this time different? Uh, no, it's not different. It all depends upon what OPEC wants to do with the price. Um, you know, they have they can undercut the United States anytime. Uh, President Trump has asked for uh, lower oil prices. Being sure we can cut the cost of lifting, um, you know, five percent, ten percent. That doesn't make up for the twenty percent loss in revenue on the top line by the low price. Um, is you know are we are we positioned maybe for uh, uh, a lack of investment going forward and, and maybe a, a, a tight squeeze that would send the price up again? Now there are a few people out there in the world who say that's coming, but I'm I'm looking at the Middle East rig count and it's almost getting back to pre-pandemic levels after being down twenty percent for the really since since twenty twenty. It's, it's pretty clear that OPEC Plus is, is very focused on bringing oil to the market. And uh, in that type of, 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 uh, of, of price war and, and production war, um, the United States and Canada are, are, are not going to be able to compete for very long. Let's wrap up the interview this way or with this question, Ed. Um, mergers and acquisitions, consolidation with the industry, that's always... Uh, a response to low prices uh, in, in other industries, and it has been 
to in the historically in the uh, oil patch. Uh, are we seeing more of that? We're going to see a lot more of it. Um, you know, Tobin's little Q, which is the the ratio of the market value of equity plus market value of debt over the replacement cost of the assets is less than one. So it's a lot cheaper for somebody with money or with, with paper to be able to acquire somebody else who really can't make good use of their assets and just play the waiting game. Um, as we know, you know, there, there are significant decline curves in the, in the horizontal plays. Uh, globally, the decline is you know, between three and 5% on, on verticals. And, and, uh, uh, and so over time, not drilling, not investing, will lead us to a point where the price will rise again to, to lead to more investment. Again, the, you know, the, the Secretary General of OPEC three years ago was complaining about the lack of investment uh, and concerned that the OPEC nations weren't replacing production with, with new reserves. I think OPEC Plus has changed its direction. And judging from the increased rig count, really in the last six months, there is, there's a big push in, in OPEC to get this going. Uh, Ed, as always, thank you very much for this. Thank you, Mark.